So we are at the original Fred Gills, yes. the oldest one, and this place has so much history when it comes to the Austin music scene and other things about our city. But, so we're going to start the tour with this Thread Gills collage. Tell us about this, Eddie. Well, the collage is an original piece that survived some of the devastation that's gone on here. It's Fire. Got, there's a picture of Janis Joplin when she was back in Port Arthur getting off from her bad habits the first time she went and uh, Dave Moriarty's car. And, is, and this Mr. Threadgill here, Oh, right? yes. Yeah, Mr. Threadgill and the Hooten. So he, he was a singer, too. He was a yodeler. Yes, okay. he was. He was a Jimmy Rogers wannabe prototype, sort of. Okay. And uh, in, in the band that he played with Dolores and the Blue Bonnet Boys, there were some incredible musicians. Joseph Castle taught guitar lessons in town. I actually took some guitar lessons in town, but he could tell that I didn't have what it took. <laughs> Uh, well, we're glad that you, you, <laughs> you did the things that you did in Austin history and purchased Threadgill's. But I want to go over here because, so, so tell us a little bit more about Kenneth Threadgill, the namesake of this place. Well, Kenneth was a... And there he is right there. there in the silver hair period. And, uh, and there he is about the same time. Uh, and there's the, there's the old station that burned uh, given me the opportunity to get it for next to nothing, but... Uh, so this was a gas station where people would come and sing? I don't get it. It was a gas station with beer license number 01 in December of 33 after Prohibition was 1933. lifted. 1933, okay. He stood in line all night and got the first, the first beer license. Okay, in the whole city. Uh-huh. So you bought this burnt out gas station? Yeah, this little strip of land here. I remember I gave him $95,000. Yeah. That was a fortune back then. Well, it was. A, it so was eighty-one. It was a fair. 80? It was a fair price for okay. this, you know, close to an acre of land. Has come One of the famous things about Threadgills is that Janis Joplin got started her. singing in public here on a fairly regular, but irregular. And this would have been the what the early sixties. Yeah. So she was just a singer from Port Arthur, Texas. She wasn't just a singer from Port Arthur, Texas. <laughs> well, I mean, when she, she started here. <laughs> she had the bells of St. Mary's in her chest, and she could rattle a room. She could make the glasses jump across the Did table. Did she always start as a rock singer, or was she more of a country singer and then turned to rock and roll? <laughs> well, it was back then it was blues, gospel, you mm -hmm. know, silver threads and golden needles, mm -hmm. you know, what do you, sure. folk music. I, I do want to show this original part because this this is kind of where it all started, right? This little room was the only the only performance area, and so people would crowd in here. What we would say, belt buckle to buttock, and uh, and like this. If you wanted a beer or two or three, you just turned around. You hollered <laughs> for it. Oh. Somebody would pass it over and you would give somebody money, and they would pass it overhead back here, and I never heard an argument about anybody getting shorted. Why do you think drew all these musicians and creative types to, to keep Austin weird and, and put it on the music map? I mean, Threadgills was there at the beginning. Time, coincidence, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of happenstance. Uh, we were the only city around with artificial moonlight towers. I mean, how wacky is that? You know? Well, I mean, it, it, we had wacky built in before we, before we, we, uh, We were keeping Austin weird before yeah, it was a slogan. Right. We were, we were making it the uh, best place we could make it to exist, unfettered by rules and regulations. And so we did a lot of things that we might not have tried to do if we were in Dallas or Houston. But Dallas and Houston poured people into our little, our scene here. Uh, they, they heard that we were getting away with murder and they wanted to, they wanted to come have a piece of that. So 
So I know recently the, the big headline was your world headquarters at Threadgills. Why did you have to shut down? Property taxes, when we started off there, the rent and, and taxes were $6,000 a month. And when, when, uh, when I finally folded the tent, uh, it was pushing $50,000 a month. And uh, it, uh, it was not, you know, a margin on meatloaf is, uh, is not possible unless you charge in $50 a meatloaf. What role do you think Threadgills played in Austin becoming the live music capital of the world and developing this reputation? Threadgills sent me home to come up with a plan, and the plan turned out to be turned out to be Armadillo World Headquarters. There was just no separating Armadillo World Headquarters and Threadgills in, in my past. I'm driving in my car. I turn on the radio. We suddenly got word that day before that uh, our weekend show was Bruce Springsteen's first performance. And uh, we had Alvin Crow playing for a dollar. And uh, I asked Alvin if he would mind splitting that dollar with this new guy from New York. Named Bruce Springsteen. And he said, okay, do whatever you want. Uh, uh, Alvin's my favorite guy in the music business. And so we got on one radio station and said, okay, we're gonna have Alvin open and then we're gonna have Bruce Springsteen and it'll just be a dollar. So Springsteen was very nervous because here are the four or five hundred hippies out there just going nuts. And Alvin had called Tiny McFarland to come in and start playing drums from Lubbock. And then he told Tiny, he said, I can't break you in tonight. There's this guy, there's a hot dog from New York named Silverstein that we're gonna blow off the stage. And so we're gonna really put it, we're gonna put it to him. And so he, Alvin's just got him going wild, and Springsteen's pacing back and forth with his guitar. Mr. Threadgill and I are standing by each other on the stage, on the side of the stage, and he looks down and he sees this guy with a guitar pacing back and forth, and he said, that young fella's just nervous as an old coon dog trying to pass a peach pit. And that's been in my vocabulary ever since. And he was describing Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. Wow. So you've really witnessed the music history in this city. I've been, I've, I've, I've had uh, my fair share of, uh, of uh, uh, those, you know, golden moments. <laughs>